I think that was a last minute addition. That was pretty good, wasn't it? I, I think he might have found out a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 16 today? We're in the midst of a study in Paul's second missionary journey uh, toward the end of last year. And uh, October through early December, we finished out the first journey. Then we had the time period between the first and second journey with the Jerusalem Council that emboldened Paul and, in this case, Silas on this second trip. In just a moment, we're going to begin reading in Acts chapter 16 and verse uh, 35. In just a moment, through chapter 7 and verse 4. You know, as you're turning there, every one of us has a desire to live his or her life on purpose. We want to know that our life is making a difference and that we have few regrets. I was reading a survey this week that uh, was given to hospice nurses and they were asked, what is the top reg regret of persons on their deathbed? And they listed the top five regrets. Number one, that I had spent more time with family Number two, that I had been a better person. Number three, that I had taken more risks in my life. Number four, that I had expressed my feelings to and for others. And number five, that I would have offered forgiveness for all wrongs. In each of these cases, people would look back on their lives and they would say, I prioritized things that I really should not have prioritized. You know, there's some famous quotes from renowned people on their deathbed who had regrets. Patrick Henry, in speaking of the Bible, said this book, the Bible, is worth all the books ever written, and it has been my misfortune that I never found time to read it with proper attention or nor feel it until recently. Randy Pausch on his deathbed, who was professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon said in 2007, as he was dying from pancreatic cancer, often it's not the things we do that we regret on our deathbed, but the things that we do not. And then Martin Freeman, the um, uh, actor from Britain, said, I've always got my eyes on my deathbed. In other words, he was living with a view toward his deathbed, that he would have no regrets. You know, we can sum up the desires of all these people with this thought. We need to live our lives on focus. And, and as we look at God's word today, that would be my desire for me, my desire for you, that we would live by the simple motto, live your life on purpose with an unhindered focus. Jesus did that. Jesus knew why he came. In fact, more than once he expressed why he came. And, and in spite of public opinion and the thoughts other people had for him, he never moved off the track that the Heavenly Father had for him. And in this study, I believe we see the same thing is true about Paul. So many times we see these distractions, these things that could have led him off course tangentially. And instead he stayed focused. And we're going to see that today. He was a man who was on focus, on point, undistracted, unrelenting, purposeful, and purpose-filled. And we're going to see that today. Look with me, uh, beginning in Acts chapter 16 and verse 35. And we'll read into chapter 7. When daylight came, the chief magistrate sent the police to say, release those men. Now remember last week, Paul was incarcerated at Philippi. Uh, they were prepared to go out. The jailer was going to take his life. Paul said, wait, don't take your life. We're all still here. He led the man to the Lord. Well, the next day, the chief magistrates, these others sent to say, release these men. The jailer reported these words to Paul. Verse 36, the magistrates have sent order for you to be released. Come now and go in peace. But Paul said to him, uh, they beat us in public without a trial, although we are Roman citizens and threw us in jail. And now are they going to send us away s secretly? Certainly not. On the contrary, let them come themselves and escort us out. 
The police reported these words to the magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to appease them. And escorting them from the prison, they urged them to leave town. After leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and departed. Chapter 17. After they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, open your word again today, and as we look at living a life without regrets, Father, we know that that comes when we live on purpose for you. And so speak in these moments as we look to your word, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the context again is this, Paul and his team, the missionary team that was with him, Luke was a part who was writing Acts, we know Silas among others, they were in Philippi. And you may have remembered again as last week, um, Paul found himself along with his friends in jail. From two weeks ago, uh, you remember that he had done a great act. He had delivered a servant girl from demon possession. And this was a good act, yet for this good act, he and his friends were thrown in prison. And as they were there, the first thing they did, and they were put in the stocks, is they began to sing and have a prayer and a praise service. That was highly unusual, said the other prisoners noted. I believe also the jailer noted. And as we said, God sent an earthquake. In the midst of all of this, uh, the uh, jail doors opened, the stocks were broken, and as they were making their way toward freedom, Paul looked back and saw that the jailer, who realized if he had lost the prisoners, would lose his life at the hands of others, decided to take matters into his own hand. But Paul said, wait, don't take your life. We're still here. And so we know that Paul had uh, just impacted people in a great way. Well, today we see that it's the next day. That's what it tells us in verse 35, when daylight comes. So the next day had come and we see that the magistrates, those who were responsible for putting him in prison, had second thoughts. They wanted now to release Paul and his company. It may have been that the earthquake, pardon the pun, rattled their consciences. It may have been that they realized that Paul and his friends had not been given due process and were treated unfairly. We don't know exactly their motive, but their desire was this. Let's release them quietly. Let's release them in a discreet way. And then we hopefully uh, will move forward and there'll be no disturbance. So I want to look today at what transpires in this event at the end of chapter 16. And again, we're looking at Paul and how he stayed laser focused, how he would not live life with any regrets. And then I want to look at the beginning of chapter 17 as Paul begins his ministry in another place. And as we do it in both of these cases, one through a singular act, the other through a repetitive act, we're going to see that Paul was a man who lived his life with no regrets. Like Jesus, he was uh, singularly focused in pleasing the Father. Well, well first today, I, I want to look at Paul's encounter with these offending chief magistrates. After all that we've looked at the past two weeks, Paul and his team, they were on a roller coaster. And so we see the magistrates, the one responsible for putting Paul and the team in jail, they're returning with a different message. And so when daylight came, verse 35, it said, release those men. 
Now, why the change? As we noted earlier, this earthquake sort of rattled them. And, and there was really a lot of superstition in that day. When an earthquake happened, they thought, uh, these pagan people thought, well, we must have offended the gods, and so they have shaken the world. So maybe uh, their consciences were bothered by that. Maybe they realized that they themselves had not gone through due process and what they had done, and, and that they could find themselves in trouble thinking they had gotten part all in trouble. And so as we look at it here, to make matters worse for them, Paul expressed to them that he was a Roman citizen. And Cicero wrote this about Roman citizens, the body of every Roman citizen was inviolable. That is, a Roman citizen had rights that could protect him or her from such treatment that Paul had received, the beating with the rods. Cicero added the Portian laws, which were from the second century BC for the Romans. It said it has removed the rod from every Roman's back. In other words, Paul was a Roman citizen and what was supposed to not happen to a Roman citizen had happened to him. And as we look at it from the view of the magistrates, they were saying, "Uh uh-oh, we have messed up big time. And so they wanted to sort of sweep this real quickly under the rug. They wanted to quickly and quietly make this right. They said, well, it's been the next day. We'll just release them quietly and everything will be okay. There won't be a disturbance. Well, Paul was a man of principle. And so he says in verse 37, now you beat us publicly and now you're going to release us quietly and secretly, and they knew Paul was right. He he was privy to their game. In in other words, you're going to embarrass us as Christians. You're going to throw shade on us as ministers of the gospel. Then you're going to realize that you're wrong. And, and, And after accusing us publicly and embarrassing us and the cause publicly, now you're going to quietly make things right. That wasn't right. But I want you to see something deeper in this as we move toward this because it's critically important to what we're looking at and that's the further narrative after verse 37. After confronting the magistrates about their wrong actions, we see that Paul follows that by willingly complying with their request. He he willingly complied. In other words, uh, verse 39, they came to appease them, Paul and the team, and then they did what Paul said. They escorted them from the prison, but they added something to it, urging us to leave town. Man, that was sort of bold, wasn't it? I mean, they had just done the man wrong, and and Paul has has gotten things sort of even here. And then they're saying, oh, by the way, to help us out, why don't you leave town? But I want you to see that Paul did that. And we see it in verse 39. There's him to leave the town. After leaving the jail, verse 40, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers and sisters and they departed. Where did they depart? Well, in chapter 17, verse 1, we see that he complied with what they said. That he left along with the team. They left Philippi. In other words, this is important. Paul let it go. He even complied with the magistrate's request. Now, we could easily say, now, come on, Paul, you have them over a ledge here. They've done you wrong. You've got to make them squirm, demand justice, get yours, get what's right. But he didn't seek justice for himself. He didn't pursue what he felt he could have received as an entitlement. Why is that? Because he was living his life on focus, on point. You know, most people who have regrets at the end of their lives, they haven't lived on point and they know it and they're convicted as they move to the end of their lives. And they say, well, I was on the right track, but then I moved in another direction. I I was diverted. Something happened in my life and it sort of moved me off focus. 
I want you to see as we look at this, Paul was demanding justice and fair treatment, not for himself personally, but for the sake of the gospel. You see, he did not want the gospel to be unhindered. He didn't want it to just go that, hey, these people are lawbreakers and they're terrible. And then secretly he, he move on and people wonder, well, what happened to them? He wasn't worried about his rights. He was worried about the advancement of the gospel. He was setting an example for others that we have nothing to be ashamed of, that we can stand boldly, that we don't have to secretly move out of town. What we're doing, we're not ashamed of. It was all about the gospel, not his own feelings, his own rights. You see, he wouldn't chase that rabbit and get off focus and have later regret. A few years ago, a key Christian figure fought for what she felt were her rights. And I shared with someone, this uh, woman it has had a tremendous impact over a number of years. And I shared with them the shame of this. And I don't know how it's all going to unfold, but the shame of this would be if this woman would be more remembered for what she stood on with her rights rather than for the sake of the gospel. You see, Paul, he could have spent months staying there in Philippi, trying to clear his name, trying to defend himself. But in doing so, he would have forsook what God had called for him to do. And that was to live a life in ministry, to continue to carry the gospel. And as we see him moving in chapter 17, we see that there were God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women who were impacted positively because he was willing to let it go and to move on. You know, believers today can become so easily distracted. Distracted from our priority, which is ministering the gospel. Some people advocate and demand personal rights. My rights are offended. I need this. I need that. There's some people that are consumed by politics. We're in a presidential election year. There are some people that will so become so focused on politics that they'll lose their focus of ministry. They'll easily become distracted. You see, Paul could have won the battle if he had stayed in Philippi, but he would not have been engaged in the spiritual war to which God called him. And there are many people today who have regrets near the end of their lives because they prioritized the wrong things. Paul didn't. Paul was laser focused. But I want you to see secondly, Paul's ministry in Thessalonica because we see that in chapter 17. You see, Paul was willing to relinquish his rights. See, once everything was sort of made right and for the sake of the gospel, it was clear that they were not lawbreakers. Paul was ready to move on and carry on in his ministry. So we see his ministry in Thessalonica beginning in chapter 17. Willingly, he leaves Philippi. And in verse 1, we see he goes through Amphipolis and Apollonia. And then he came to Thessalonica, a leading, a capital city there in Macedonia. And when they stop there, we see something very familiar, something we have seen throughout this study, and that is a familiar entity, the synagogue. And so it says, and Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scripture. What do we see in this? Paul had a pattern in his Christian life. There was a pattern to it. He, he went into the synagogue. Uh, follow our study over these few months. And I know I was gone a few weeks um, in, in December, but going back to October in chapter 13 and verse five, it says there in Solomon, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues. In chapter 13 and verse 14, in Pisidia, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. In chapter 13 and verse 42, the people urged them in Pisidia and Antioch to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. Chapter 13 and verse 44, the following Sabbath, people gathered to hear. In chapter 14 and verse 1, in Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue. In chapter 16 and verse 11, he expected to find a place of prayer. In that city, there was not a synagogue, but he still was in the habit. He still was in the pattern of finding a corporate gathering. And now in Thessalonica, it is the Sabbath day, and he went into the synagogue, and for three Sabbaths, he reached reasoned from the scriptures. 
They were evangelizing. It says they were explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead. He was proclaiming Jesus is the Messiah. Now I want you to see what it says in verse 2. As usual, he went into the synagogue. You know, a person that has no regrets, there's a pattern to that life. There's, there's a focus and there's activity that is centered around that focus. As usual, he went into the synagogue. Paul lived an ordered life. And that ordered life was centered around Jesus. Was he going to be distracted when he had the upper hand back in Philippi and go off on another tangent? No, he wasn't. He was going to stay focused on what God had called him to do. And it wasn't to, to, to assert his rights. God would take care of him. He would carry out the ministry of the gospel. Many people reach the end of their lives and they regret and they have lots of regrets because they did not live an ordered and disciplined life. Not Paul. There was a pattern to his life that included synagogue attendance. It included ministry and prayer. There are many people today who say, you don't need pattern in your life. You don't have to be routine in your spiritual life. Get up in the morning and read the Bible Attend church on Sundays, that's just being legalistic. But that same person will not miss a single episode of CSI Vegas, which is coming on at 10 o'clock on Sunday nights. They'll every week be sitting right in front of that TV with popcorn and a soda in their hand. Yet they'll say, routine? Not in a spiritual life. How wrong they can be. Paul pursued regular corporate gathering. Wherever he went, where's the synagogue? Where's the place of prayer? He pursued regular instruction in the Bible. He pursued it. He wanted, that was part of the synagogue worship was instruction in the word of God. He had a spiritual pattern. He, he was involved in regular ministry of the gospel. When he attended the synagogue, not only was he blessed in the fellowship, not only did he receive instruction, but he was communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, where does all of this lead us? This pattern life, this example in Philippi where he didn't chase the rabbiting and, and where he was not tempted to, to follow the wrong thing. And it's this, listen to these words, Paul speaks in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. There's reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. That's a deathbed statement. I don't see any regret. I have. I will. I have. There's reserved for me. There was a confidence in that. What about you today? Does the pattern of your life lead you to such confidence? Is regular time with other believers in the word and ministry, does that characterize your life? If not, it can be. When all of this sort of meets the road as we close this morning, the question is, how does this apply to me? Well, I will say for most of us, uh, there's a lot we do not have in common with Paul. Very few of us will travel on extensive mission trips, uprooting our lives for months and years at a time to travel and communicate the gospel. But like Paul, we can live our lives on point. Do you know how you live your life on point? You live your life on point by hearing from God. God doesn't call us all to the same ministry. We serve the same king and in the same kingdom, but we need to understand what God has called us to do, and we need to stay on point in that, prioritizing the ministry that God has given to us. Could you see how easy it would have been for Paul at Philippi to have taken on this, this personal crusade to win a battle against these individuals? How easy it could have been, but no, he said, that's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to preach the gospel. I wonder today, are you being sidetracked by these tangential things? 
Possessing the discipline of a pattern life is critical. Consistent Bible study, involvement in the fellowship with believers, ministering without interruption. Because unless the Lord comes to take us first, every one of us will die. And some of us, we may have an extended illness or time to contemplate our lives. And I sort of agree with that actor who said we need to live our lives with an eye toward our deathbed. Are you living your life without regret today? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Or, or are you caught up in things that have moved you away from the singular call of God on your life? I pray that if that's the case today, that you'll say today's a new day. I'm going to set my life on that course that's right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek God and whatever God's called me to do, I'm going to lift him up. I'm not going to get caught up on my rights or this political movement or that. I'm going to focus on the gospel message. Let's pray. Father, as we look today, we thank you for a man with the boldness of the Apostle Paul. Father, there were so many things that could have distracted him, untracked him. Lord, he was in prison. He was falsely accused. Lord, there was the temptation of his own rights. All of these things. Yet, Lord, we continue to say, see, that he showed up that he was consistent and that, Lord, he kept his hand to the plow and the call of God on his life. And, Father, we know that he could breathe those words that he had fought the good fight. Lord, it's our desire, not what we think about our lives or what anyone else, but that, Lord, there would be that day where you would say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, for that to be the case... We've got to live our lives on focus. Lord, help us to do it. We can't do it in our own strength. Father, whatever you have called us to do, if it is ministering to the elderly, if it's ministering to the youth, if it's through the ministry of song or in uh, serving of food or serving as a deacon or teaching or, or whatever ministry, the, the facilities here, whatever it is, Lord, may we keep our hand to the plow, glorifying you in it. And I pray it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing song today and hymn of invitation is Jesus.